This week on the Hollywood and Toto podcast, we ask why it's taking forever to find the new James Bond. We talk with Andrew Clavin about the culture and his excellent new book, The House of Love and Death. And we explain why horror is having a moment. Welcome to the Hollywood and Toto podcast. Entertainment news and reviews without the woke Hollywood narrative. Free speech, free expression. Now that's entertainment. And here's your host, award-winning film critic, Christian Toto. Before we start, I'd love it if you subscribe to the Hollywood and Toto podcast. We've got new episodes every Wednesday, plus more bonus episodes coming your way fast. My dad's favorite movie was Shane. It's my son's middle name, too. And if you've seen it, I think you'll know the clip you're about to hear. Our gunslinger did what he had to do, and now he's moving on again. There's a price to pay for killing, even if it saves good people in a good community. Of course, little Joe is begging Shane to come back, come back, Shane. But he can't, and they both know it. That clip gets me verklempt every time I hear it, without fail. But you know what? Now hearing it reminds me of a classic movie franchise. 007, Bond, James Bond. When's he coming back? Now, we technically left us in 2021 with No Time to Die. That was the last Bond movie. But the film's star Daniel Craig told us a while ago that he was done being a super spy. You can't blame the guy. Go Google all the injuries he suffered in the making of these movies. It's brutal. It's not for older people. He's in his 50s now. He's not ready for this kind of gig. So he's stepping aside. Smart move. So who's the new 007? Who's going to be James Bond? (laughs) We have no idea. Every other day you see a news story saying, whoa, so-and-so is leading the pack or his favorite too. No, none of it's true. The Broccoli family owns 007. They own the franchise. And they have no idea what's going to go, what's going to happen next. It'll be reinvented, they told the press recently. And that's as much as they're saying. But they're not saying anything about what that even means. What does reinvention have to do with anything? Well, you know, Bond has to, you know, change with the times. Well, to a certain degree, maybe. I mean, Sean Connery once swatted a woman's butt on, on one of the adventures. We don't want to see that. But we also don't want to see Bond be anything but Bond. Huh. What's going on here? So we've known for a long while now that we need a new actor to play James Bond. That's maybe five or six years ago we've realized that. And Team Broccoli is no closer to figuring out who that person will be or the adventures or the themes or anything. (laughs) No rush, guys and gals. I mean, it's not like it's the oldest film franchise and it might lose some cultural cachet if it stays on the sidelines much longer, right? I mean, that's, that's not happening. So what gives? I mean, when you read the quotes and you hear the commentary, it's almost like the Broccoli's don't even want to be in the Bond business. I mean, listen, I I guess they love the residuals and the cultural gravitas it gives them. I mean, it is a Bond franchise still. It does mean something. But it's not like they're juggling a half dozen franchises like Disney does. I mean, give the Mouse House some credit. They can multitask over there. I mean, who else kills multiple properties at once? We kid. (laughs) Well, maybe not so much. The Broccoli's have just one property, Bond, and they're dragging their feet on it. Now, there is one explanation here that does make some sense, just one. We keep hearing rumors that director Christopher Nolan, Mr. Oppenheimer himself, is circling the Bond franchise. But sealing that deal is proving to be a challenge. He's not easy. He's particular. He should be particular. And that's what's causing all these delays. 
Now, it's the only explanation that makes sense here, but it's also one of the few hopeful signs I see for a Bond moving forward. There is no way that Bond will go woke with Christopher Nolan behind the camera. Not a chance. Now, the last few Bond films did teeter on the edge of woke without going over for sure. Bond has feelings. He's monogamous. One of the new female characters became 007. Take that, patriarchy. But it didn't go all the way, even though the people behind the scenes and the actors talked about it like it was going full-on woke. Oh, what a terrible mistake. By the way, the box office results stateside for No Time to Die. Disappointing. And not just because of COVID. I think some of that banter for about a year and a half is saying, it's woke, it's woke, even though it really wasn't completely. I think it hurt the bottom line. But I still, with or without Nolan, have a glimmer of hope that our hero, who has read me to the core, is not going to go vegan anytime soon. But you know what? If this drags on and on, and those Nolan rumors prove to be just rumors, who's to say we're all going to be here for Bond when he finally comes back? I'll say one thing about Andrew Clavin. He writes a mean book forward. Okay, the great writer and podcaster penned my book forward a while ago. That was Virtue Bombs, How Hollywood Got Woke and Lost Its Soul. It is absolutely one of my career highlights, not just to write a book, but to have Andrew Clavin write the forward. Oh my gosh, I just can't believe it. But Andrew's work has had a sizable impact on far more than me. He really has impacted the conservative movement. He's written for the big screen, often, I think A Shock to the System is my favorite movie that he worked on. That was, of course, with Michael Caine. But he's also written young adult novels, horror stories, first-rate mysteries. He even created a ghost story app a little while ago called Haunting Melissa. This guy's got range and just talent to burn. And, of course, there's the Andrew Clavin podcast, which is brilliant. It's part of the Daily Wire ecosystem. It's funny. It's smart. It's wise. Sometimes all at once. I don't even know how he does that, but he does it again and again. And he's been telling conservatives for a while now that ignoring pop culture is going to come back to haunt us. It's exactly what's happening now, and he couldn't have been more right, and we're finally starting to pay attention to that. But boy, things would be a lot better if we did it when he first started warning us about it. But now Andrew's created his signature character. I think I would say that's the case. I think he would as well. He's a college professor who moonlights as a sleuth. He has a strange habit of mind, you could say. He's able to figure out clues, put pieces together, but there's much, much more to Cameron Winter than that. And of course, he is the hero of three Clavin novels. You've got When Christmas Comes, A Strange Habit of Mind, and now the just-released book, The House of Love and Death. The newest Cameron Winter mystery is a corker, no doubt. It follows a family that's been wiped out as horrific crime, their house has been burned to the ground, what happened and why. And it investigates a small town which looks so picturesque on the outside, but once you get closer, boy, there are a lot of demons lurking about. I'd say it's a perfect stocking stuffer given this time of the year, but who wants to wait two months to read it? I'd read it right now. I'm so glad to have Andrew back on the show, and he shares a lot more about the creative process behind The House of Love and Death, also Hollywood's bizarre reaction to the Hamas atrocities, and so much more. Andrew Clavin is one of a kind, and I'm so glad to share him with you right now. Andrew, welcome back to the show. Now, you've written written so many great stories, ghost stories, young adult stories, stories ripped from the headlines, but I get the sense you've found your creative muse with Cameron Winter. Is that fair, and why do you think it took a while before he came into your creative life? That's a really interesting question. I I think it has to do with coming to this This late point in my career, what has got to be, time being what it is, it's got to be the final stretch of my career when you kind of look back and you think, "What what have I been writing about all this time and what have I learned from it? And I think Cameron Winter kind of grew up organically from that. I, I find myself thinking back to what for me is, is my origin story as a crime writer, which is the moment I read the opening of The Big Sleep by Raymond Chandler, his, his first Philip Marlowe novel. And I was a kid, I was maybe 14 or 15. I was looking for male role models in fiction because I couldn't find any in real life. And I was I always found the tough guy writers and the tough guy actors like Humphrey Bogart and John Wayne, people like that, very appealing. 
But there was something about Philip Marlowe that was a pure deal. And that what happens in that front first page is as Marlowe goes to visit his rich client, he sees a stained glass window with a picture of a knight rescuing a lay a tied up lady. And he says, Marlowe says, if it, if if I lived in this house, I would have to climb up there and help him because he's just not getting the job done <laughs> fast enough. And the idea that, and he follows through with this through the rest of the big sleep, is that Marlowe is a, a shoddy, uh, low rent, working class guy in a totally corrupt modern town, but he carries within him the ideal of the knight, the ideal of chivalry, and and that's what Raymond Chandler wrote about him in a, in his famous essay. I think it's called the the Art of Murder. He, he said, down these mean streets, a man must go who is not himself mean, who is neither tarnished nor afraid. And I remember as a kid thinking, yes, that is what I want. What I want is to understand, to be very realistic about the world, mm -hmm. but to carry within me this ideal of what I should be, regardless of what the world is. And Cameron Winter, because he is an English professor, because he's a scholar of English literature, carries within him the... Western culture, all of the great ideals of Western culture, but he's surrounded by a culture that is falling apart. And he's affected by that. He's shaped by it to some degree, but he is still trying to recover that ideal. So he's kind of the ultimate expression of what I started out to look for as a crime writer. And he's the it's the first time I have ever written a character where I said to myself, this is a series. Mm -hmm. I have written other trilogies. I once wrote a, a tetralogy, but this is the first time I thought, no, I want to carry this out for at least 10 books and work through this guy's development and his conclusions. And that's just a fresh new thing for me. Yeah, yeah. And I think that what's make, what makes great art is that collision of ideals and reality. It's often very messy, but that's what matters. You know, I, I was kind of wondering when you write your stories, do you have a bit of a strange habit of mind when it comes to creating the crimes that he has to solve? Or is it a lot of coffee, a lot of hard work, a lot of dead ends? What's, what's, what's sort of the, uh, the, the mission here? Well, I, I mean, my, my method of working is to eliminate as much dead end time as I can mm -hmm. because I take such joy out of writing that I do a lot, a lot of preliminary work, a lot of outlining stuff I find very boring, but stuff that means that once I'm done, I can then proceed and just create the thing that I'm doing. But, but more importantly for me, I, I think Winter's strange habit of mind, this habit where he lets this kind of a Zen thing almost where he lets go of all his opinions, all his preconceived notions, all the things he loves and hates and, uh, you know, decries and praises. He just lets them all go and just lets the facts sort of float in space in his mind. And it's it's kind of a way of him finding what it is to be a human being in the world. You know, I mean, it, we have this kind of stupid idea. We either have this idea of human beings as just flesh bags with chemical sets inside so that we have no spiritual being, no actual spiritual being. It's just an emanation of our physicality. But we also have this kind of contradictory and yet complementary idea that human beings are completely rational animals, that artificial intelligence could be somehow some fair representation of what we are. And it's just not true. I mean, part of what we do is this instinctive, this soulful, spiritual ex exploration of who people are. You know, we can sit down across from somebody and know in a single instant, whether this is an honest person or a, a false person, we mm -hmm. can know whether he's smart or kind or good or, or all these things. We can get it wrong, but we can also so often get it so right. And so Winter brings that capacity, that fullness of his humanity to solving crimes. He is not just an intellectual Sherlock Holmesian crime solver. Yeah, I think that's almost intrinsic. I know my mom and dad, my dad didn't have a, a, a great intellect or he didn't go to school, didn't go to college, but he, he just knew people and he, he would know people and I would take about a month and a half to get it. And then he'd say, oh yeah, I knew that right <laughs> away. Uh, the, yes. house, the House of Love and Death, it has a lot of cultural issues in there. The rotten academia, the role pornography plays in our lives. Sin is all consuming. When you're writing, do you, do you kind of gently layer these themes in or do they emerge as the story emerges and then you are able to kind of work them in in a fashion? Well, I, I start out with the culture that I'm living in. I'm not trying to write 
politically. I'm not trying to say, oh, mm-hmm. vote Democrat, vote Republican. Oh, no, that, yeah. none, none of that is 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 stuff that defines a, a character. I mean, a character might have a political point of view, but that's not who he is. Uh, it may grow out of who he is, but it doesn't define him. So I don't. I let everybody have their own opinions. I mm-hmm. let all my characters free. But look, this is the world we're living in right now. And I'm what I've done with the winter books is I've taken it and I've pushed it just a little further down the road. So he's really living in the end times of the Republic. And even though it's not a futuristic story, it's happening and things things that we know are going on are going on in there. I do choose those things that I think are indicative of decay and, and of uh, decadence. And so he, because I wanted to pit the ideal within winter against a society that's unraveling a place where ideals are being thrown aside and turned upside down i do pick things from the culture that speak to me about that and those and that's how they get there and they become plot points they become important plot points and uh, i have to tell you uh, i have had to defend them against editorial interference i've had to basically say no i'm not cutting these out even if the new york times doesn't like it even if it's going to hurt me with certain readers not because i want to express an opinion, but because I want to represent the culture as it actually is. What are the comments that you receive? I mean, that's surprising because I don't think it's heavy handed in the least way, but it does give a, a texture to the stories. What What are the complaints? If you can share something. Oh, yeah. Oh, you have no idea how uh, woke, seriously, publishing publishing for a while was a bastion against wokeness as Holly was going down the drain. But now there are things like sensitivity readers. There are mm. things, uh, there are comments like, you know, you must remove this because the minute a critic sees this, he's going to hit you for it. There's a very, very light uh, plot point that has to do with transgenderism and where it stands in the mm-hmm. lives of uh, teenage girls. That, that was a problem. Uh, I've gotten notes. I swear I'm not making this up. I've gotten notes where people have said, uh, an editor will say, well, you shouldn't refer to this person as having coffee colored skin because colored people had to pick coffee as part of their <laughs> slate, you know, and you think like, well, still, it's still the same color as latte. I've got to describe it somehow. And and you really have to fight this kind of small minded, pinched, woke idea that thinks that it conceives of itself as a resistance to tyranny, but in fact is the tyranny and it's a tyranny of mind. And I simply will not let it. My, my point of view, seriously, is I have a muse. My muse tells me what to write. I write what my muse tells me what to write. No one has that muse. No one else has access to it. No one else. People can editors can make great comments about how you fail to get that down on paper, but no one can tell me what I see in the world or what I'm supposed to write about. That's, that's where I, I'm willing to pull a book easily, clearly, mm-hmm. without even thinking about it. And those are the things that I defend, but you have to defend them more and more and against younger and younger people. I mean, yeah. because some of the people down the editorial line are like 12 years old. <laughs> you really, you really have to stand up to them. Yeah. Well, intellectually they're 12. I mean, they actually might be yeah. in their twenties, but <laughs> they remain 12 forever. Yeah. One of the themes of both your book, this conversation and also your podcast is that the end of the Republic, it, it said in quasi jest, but I think there's more truth to it than we realize. And I, I feel it too. When you write the Cameron Winters stories, does it offer you comfort in this process or does it even suggest, hey, it ain't over yet. We, we still have time. There's still a chance to reclaim what was good and decent. Uh, how, do, how do you emerge from that? Yeah, I, th- I think there's always a chance. I, I do not think the future is written. If it is, it's not written in the minds of men, you know, and so we do not do not know what's going to happen. I've seen, I've lived through the world turning around completely politically uh, in the 70s, which were very much like this time. Now I saw, you know, guys like Ronald Reagan and Rudy Giuliani completely uh, flip the script and, and turn decline into prosperity. Still, there's very large strains of rot running through our academic culture, our intellectual culture, and our artistic culture. And I think those have to be written about. So I would never, you know, unless I was writing an apocalyptic, futuristic novel, I would never say the end Mm -hmm. times have come. That would be ridiculous. But I do want to show things as they are. And this is not a good time. You know, when you have students, you know, protesting in favor of people who cut off the heads of babies and rape women and saying, oh, well, this is justified because of my theory that my professor taught me, you know, that that's a bad time. That is something that really is difficult. And when you have the ideal of freedom, which is the basis of this country set aside for some 
kooky idea of uh, equality of outcome between people, you know that we're going down a wrong road. And I think that there are large centuries old issues involved there. And there are also modern decades old issues. And so I want uh, the, one of the things I really like about Cameron Winter is he can deal with both of those because he has a historical perspective, but mm -hmm. he's also lived through a certain period of history when he has acted in, and done terrible things in service of his country and now has to ask himself, was that worth it? Did I just, you know, ruin my soul for nothing? And I think those are really important questions that we're all asking right now. When I look back at the culture and the conversations we have about it, I, I, I joke, but it's not really a joke that you were the Paul Revere, you were the one warning conservatives about the culture wars, about not ignoring pop culture. And, you know, now we're seeing the Daily Wire is just absolutely going Hollywood. I've seen a lot of rebellious comedians who are telling the jokes that Colbert won't tell. We're seeing a counterculture art essentially emerging, a lot of it thanks to technology and making it much more possible. But I want to paraphrase someone you may know from your earlier years, Ed Koch. How are we doing? What's your take on, on some of the things <laughs> we're seeing these days? Well, I, first of all, I'm so proud to, to be part of the Daily Wire with what they're doing. I see uh, Glenn Beck taking on more, uh, you know, independence and looking for more freedom. As you say, the comedians who are taxed, their job is to actually point out the absurdity of the times. And you can't point out the absurdity of, uh, you know, there's nothing more absurd than a resistance that uh, is comprised of, is composed of every single powerful entity <laughs> in the country. So you have to ask yourself, what are you resisting? Oh, it's us, by the way. Uh, you know, um, I, look, it's, it's new, it's fresh, it's delicate, but it's actually happening. So you're seeing the first green buds of spring kind of creeping up through the cracking ice, Will the ice freeze over and kill it? Will it, you know, will uh, forces that are powerful shut us down? They're going to try. That's certainly going to happen. But counterculture is a very powerful thing. And the most important thing, I think, for us is to recognize that this culture did not decay overnight. It wasn't lost in an election. It wasn't lost in a day. We've lost over 60 years of cultural action that the left took and that people who don't believe in freedom took. And so it's going to take a long time. And that means that people are going to suffer. People are going to be fired. They're going to be canceled. They're going to lose their jobs. They're going to lose their spots on social media. All of these things have happened to me. And I have simply kept going, doing exactly what you just said, using every outlet that was available to me. And all I can say about that is it's a lot more fun than just waking up every morning and, you know, accepting a paycheck, fighting corrupt, lying, ugly hearted bastards uh, is kind of a fun way to make a living. <laughs> so, and so I, I recommend it to all artists with the true heart of rebellion that is in uh, that is in the arts. And I I'm hopeful, you know, let me let me put it that way. I, I'm hopeful, but it's going to it's a long march. It was a long march when they won. It's going to be a long march to beat them back. We must not get carried away and think, oh, you know, this this congressional election in Ohio is the most important thing that's happening because the most important thing that's happening is always happening off screen. It's always happening because some small guy is writing something brilliant in a room by himself. And those are the people we have to support. Those are the people we have to review. We have to build structures. I mean, look, you've been in the forefront of building a, a, uh, superstructure to support the arts. We need so much more of that. I mean, it's just beginning, but we need awards. We need, you know, review venues. We need all these things in order to make, in order to create space mm -hmm. for freedom in the arts. They have all the power, they have all the technology, they have all the money, but what we have is the truth and hopefully the courage to, to speak the truth through the arts. And I think that I'm, I'm hopeful that that moment is coming around. As you say, I've been I've been preaching this now for well over 20 years. And we are much when I started out, I was talking into a vacuum. Mm -hmm. Now everybody knows what I'm talking about. Yeah, everybody that's... knows. Nobody, nobody looks at me with that, you know, confusion anymore. And thank goodness. And by the way, I met a Gina Carano, I guess a year or so ago, and she talked about knowing that they would cancel her and knowing that she wouldn't be allowed to speak. And she spoke anyway. And she was canceled yep. and she's bouncing back on her own terms. But 
she seemed joyful about it. She seemed like she was able to look at herself in the mirror and, and not flinch. And I thought that was really powerful. And I've spoke to other creators who have been canceled in certain ways back and forth, but they emerge stronger. They have a, a bigger audience too. And I, I always want to share that message. You know, y- your work is dovetailed in Hollywood and you've talked about how they cast you aside once you actually had an opinion. I was curious about what you've, I don't know if you've addressed this directly on your podcast, but Hollywood seems like they're in trouble. Disney's in trouble. Uh, the streamers are losing a lot of money. And, you know, when I go to bed, I watch my favorite YouTube cooking channel. I don't watch late night mm-hmm. TV. Do you think Hollywood's in for a pretty significant course correction? What, what's your t- sense on that? I know it's kind of a, a big, broad question, but just I want to get your take on, on where the industry is going, because I think there's a lot of flux happening. Well, I, I think, look, the, the culture is dead. I mean, even the New York Times just wrote a piece saying, why is the culture dead? And then coming up with all these fancy notions about why it is. But it's dead because their ideas aren't true. And you cannot create out of woke culture. You cannot build anything that looks like humanity and looks like reality. And so woke culture is just an offense to the, to the arts. I mean, as any um, ideological idolatry is going to be an offense to the arts. The, the Soviets never created any great art either. And except in rebellion. And that's happening here to us today. Everything is repetitive. You've seen every show before. The, what was the golden age of television is petering out into repetition and nonsense. The music stinks. The books are not all that good. This is a moment of true stagnation. I, in my experience, it's not what happens is small venues start to spring up doing other things and those things catch on and they become as as the new york times is declaring oh this is going to happen next something else entirely happens next because the people catch on to it and i think that that's already beginning to happen and what happens then is the bigs then turn around to these small venues and say we want a piece of that mm-hmm. and they start to either buy up the venues or imitate them and that's what transforms Uh, an art form. That's what transforms a culture. And so that is what I would expect to see now. I do not expect to see, you know, whoever is in charge of the the big studio come in and say, we've got to stop with this feminism stuff. You know, not every couple has to be mixed race. Why, by golly, there were no powerful black people in the 18th century in in Europe. Let's not cast any, you know, that nobody's going to do that. But we can do it. Mm. And and if we start to do it, the truth is so powerful. And and the absurdity of the human condition is so clear that once it comes out, people catch on and young people especially like it. And I think it's really important that good people do it because bad people are always going to do it. You know, bad people, you know, for instance, just just take a, a an easy example. There's very high crime in black communities. If you lie about that, you give power to bigots, people who come out and say there's something inherent about black people that are going to commit crimes, which I just think is a nonsense. But but if if honest, good people and loving people and people who love humanity don't speak the truth, the truth then belongs to the haters. And so ultimately what we need to do is we need to have people who are both uh, compassionate to the human situation and compassionate to the sinfulness of man uh, about the sinfulness of mankind, but also willing and courageous enough to speak the truth in the face of people telling them that if you are compassion, compassionate, you'll keep your mouth shut. And if you don't keep your mouth shut, you're racist or hateful. Yeah. And that's, that's the situation that each of us faces and the choice each of us has to make. We need to have a conversation about race, but if you say the wrong thing, oh, you're, you're in trouble. So that oh, just, yeah. just keep quiet. You know, the, the Hamas atrocities have been on my mind. I can't stop thinking about it. And, yeah. I, and I've been, you know, I've obviously I follow Hollywood aggressively and I, you know, some of the comments have been uh, encouraging. Some of them have been shocking and this whole, you know, we need to have a ceasefire tomorrow. I, 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 any thoughts about Hollywood's reaction? You know, I don't know if you saw there was a clip by Ryan Long, a great comedian, who was making fun of it. Your your typical actor just frozen. Like, who do I post? What do I? What side to go on? You know, it, it was it was a very funny bit, but it really did speak truth about Hollywood actors who are activists first, and they don't even know they don't even have a moral compass at this point. Yeah, no, I, I saw Ryan's thing. It was very funny. Uh, he's always really uh, entertaining. I, I, uh, I think that this has been a, not just a tremendous failure, but it's been a wake up call to anybody with a conscience. We have kind of disallowed the moral voice of the human heart. To the, we've disallowed the moral voice of the human heart. Period. And so, 
when people have their theories, when they say, oh, I'm going to make up the, the idea that people can change their gender or, you know, oh, I'm going to make up the idea that we can make all people have equal outcomes, something that's never happened anywhere on the face of the planet ever and never will. Oh, you know, we're going to we're going to have equity by not teaching uh, white people math and then they'll be equal to black people, possibly the most racist idea <laughs> I've ever heard, you know, it, it, no one stops except on the right and only the people of goodwill on the right. No one stops and says, that's immoral. And here's why it's immoral. Here is what you are doing that's wrong. When you find yourself, I mean, this is this is what I this is the the great turning point of my life when I was 19 years old, when I read Crime and Punishment, when I read the murder scene in Crime and Punishment, and I said to myself, no, there is no such thing as a relative reality. There are some things that are wrong, no matter even if everybody on earth says they're right. And therefore, if you find yourself marching in support of people who cut off the heads of babies, if you find yourself cheering for people who rape women on the bodies of their loved ones whom they just killed, change your mind. Change your mind. Somewhere along the line, you got the equation wrong. If you don't have that moral compass, if you don't have that basic understanding of good and evil, it's very hard to explain it to you. You know, there are certain words that are primary words. They have no definition. Man, woman, good, evil. These are just things you have to know because you're a human being. Once you see yourself in bed with someone who murders innocents, no matter what his cause is, you have to get out of bed and change your mind and change your direction. And if we don't start speaking like that and explaining that this is something that the human heart already knows and should not ignore and can't be talked out of by some idiot academic who feels bad about himself and wants you to feel bad too, if we don't actually have the moral authority to say those things, we will be wiped away. If we think we can win with pure Pure logic, then we simply haven't been reading our philosophy. Pure logic will get you any, anywhere you want to go. And that's a, that's a true problem. And so this, this moral voice has been silenced. It's been silenced by science, mock science. It's been, it's been silenced by academic theory. It's been silenced by people who want the world to be a certain way that it simply is not. And so we have to speak with a different voice. And, and to do that, you have to really think about where morality is planted, what the ramifications of there being an objective morality are. And we have to start to embrace that even when it goes against the default position of our society. Yeah, I think we've become so tribalized that we fall in line with certain thinking, even when it is beyond rational. Uh, you know, this conversation in a way reminds me of your podcast, which is so good, is so nourishing. The opening satire alone is just incredible. I was curious, when you fire up that microphone, obviously you've got themes for a particular episode, but are you, are you, what are your big picture uh, theories there? Because what, what, I feel like your, your podcast has shifted in the last few months. It was always good. It just feels different these days. I'm, I'm kind of curious how you approach it now as, as opposed to in the well, past. Well, first of all, thank you for the the kind words. Uh, one of the things we did, and this was a decision that I made, was I decided to we we were doing an hour and a half show, and that was contract what I was contracted for, and and it would have an interview, and it would I cover the news, and I do a satire, and all these different things, and I, I was I did not I felt that there was room to improve it. I, I do not want to do anything unless I can do it at what I think is is the highest level I'm capable of. And so I reinvented the show to go for one hour and then do a half hour interview in the middle of the week and just separate them so I don't have to bring these things together. That made it easier for me to stick to a single theme and mm -hmm. to see the, the events of the week in context of that theme. And I think, I think it's been a huge improvement on the show. I think it has revolutionize the show people keep picking on me because we changed the theme song we had a funny theme song <laughs> but i thought you know I, I i thought you know the funny theme song doesn't fit the times it fit the yeah, times yeah. in which we started but now things are getting a little darker uh, a little grimmer and we're going to need a lot more heart and a lot more um honest looking at ourselves and at others and the other thing i've stopped doing that has really been helpful is I've stopped listening to the reactive voices. I mean, every time I open my mouth, and I think this is probably true of anybody who opens his mouth ever, you start to hear, you know, the people who tell you, no, you must condemn this, and no, you must hate this, and you must, you must support DeSantis, you must support Trump, you must, uh, you know, condemn this kind of sexuality or that kind of behavior, that kind of language. And I just thought, you know what? 
I don't have to condemn anybody. You know, I'm not here to talk about what I hate. We can all see the problems that we hate. I'm here to talk about who we should be. And that's, you know, takes me back to where we started with Raymond Chandler and Philip Marlowe. I want to talk about the ideal that we carry within ourselves, even if it falls apart in the world around us. And so the stories that I choose to cover, I, you know, obviously you have to cover the big news of the day, but the stories that I choose to cover and the themes that I look for are themes that I hope will guide us to a, a way of looking at ourselves in a, instead of a way of hating the people on the other side. That I know that that is the most popular thing you can do. I know that I lose audience when I say, you know what? Trump did a wrong thing here. And yes, the left is wrong here, but we're wrong. I know that that is not the most popular thing, but it's the only way. It's the only way I can lift what I'm doing above mere politics and make it what I think is the most important thing, which is cultural. You know, no political party gets everything right. No political philosophy gets everything right. No philosophy, period, gets everything right. But the human heart does have a guide. We are equipped with a conscience. It is it, it is an organic way of looking at the world that is not accidental. This is the big lie. You know, the big lie is that whatever you think of evolution as a means of advancing uh, or or changing nature, whatever you think of it, it's not random. There is a an intelligence that informs the human world. There is no other way to explain what we see and what we do and what we know. If you want to believe that, oh, you know, you think it's okay to behead a child and I don't, and who who can say who can say which which of us is right? Well, run for Congress because you're not smart <laughs> enough to be doing a podcast. Right? <laughs> you know? so, and and so that's that's what what I have done. I've con- reconstructed the show to allow me to develop my themes in a clean, uh, sharp way that are that explain what I see in the news. But also, I've just started to ignore uh, those people who are pounding their fists, their, their palms with their fists, because they're just so sure that they've got it right, and everybody else has gotten it wrong. And I, I, I to me, I am really proud of what the show has become. I really it has, it has, I, revolutionized the show. It has made me wake up with new excitement. And even in this time, which is a very dark time, I feel like I'm I'm going in and contributing something to the conversation that nobody else has contributed. I couldn't agree more. And it's unlike any other podcast around. And I say that in the best of ways. Andrew, before I let you go, I'm sure there's another Cameron Winter novel in the works. You got that. I'm sure that's happening. But are there any other projects as if you're not busy enough is there anything else you've got lined up, either novels or or anything you can share, or even tease at this point? Yes, I'm. You know, I, I really uh, loved writing my last nonfiction book, The Truth and Beauty, which was about looking at secular poetry and showing how it connected with and explained some of the religious thought that was going through uh, Europe at that time and and before and after that time. And I'm, I'm working on a kind of a, I won't call it a sequel, but it's a book in the same genre, uh, looking at the arts and finding out what we can f- see from this time, more popular arts, more mm. um, more modern arts, but looking at the thing, those things and seeing what it is that they're saying about our society and how we can respond in a spiritual way to the things that are, I think, troubling all of us. Uh, questions of sexuality, questions of morality, questions of tradition and and where we come from and where we're going. And I think uh, that's a a work that I'm extremely excited about. I'm hoping it'll be not just a book, but maybe some kind of documentary as well, because I think Mm. it's got a lot of good good visuals in it. And I'm hoping to, to be able to finish that uh, midway through next, through around the middle of next year, and hopefully uh, go forward. I just, uh, you know, just before I came on, I got the contract for it, and so we're set to go. And I'm really excited about it. Excellent! It sounds like an amazing project. But uh, Andrew, thanks for joining the show. The new book, of course, is The House of Love and Death. I have to say, it's my favorite of the three Cameron Winters stories, and that's as high a compliment as I can give. And of course, you can find it on Amazon or your favorite bookseller. And of course, check out The Andrew Clavin Show. It's an amazing podcast. It, it's it's nourishing. And I think that's maybe the best way for me to explain it. And it is so unique in the space and so different. And you know, when you have opinions, when you have thoughts, you can kind of see them coming to life. And that's a, it's an amazing thing to see. And <laughs> there's no hot takes here. And that might be the most, the most advantageous part of the show. But uh, Andrew, thanks so much for uh, joining us. Uh, Thank you. And thanks for those kind words, Christian. They mean a lot to me. Thanks.
One last note before we say adios. You know, I just wrapped the 31 days of horror at HollywoodInToto.com. Plug alert. I focus on movies that weren't getting enough attention this time of the year. And listen, we all talk about The Omen, The Exorcist, The Shining, Halloween. Those are the classics. We get that. We've seen them a million times. We're going to watch them a million times more, and that's good. But there are other films that just flew under the radar that maybe you missed, but you should check them out. Now, I love horror movies. This is why I made that list. It's my favorite genre, but it's interesting that horror is really having a moment right now. And I'm not talking about Halloween or any sort of seasonal connections. We've had big, big hits like Smile and Megan and Insidious the Red Door. Right now, Five Nights at Freddy's is killing it in theaters. And others are doing well, too. Not as well, but good enough. A lot of horror movies have smaller budgets, so if they make 60, 70 million, that is a significant amount of money. A lot of films would kill for that return on investment. And you know, when the pandemic hit a few years ago and my wife was recovering from cancer, all I wanted to do was watch horror movies. Nothing else, nothing significant, no Oscar winning movies, horror. And in an odd way, it kept me sane. And I think about that now, and I, I, I think we all need that. We need an escape. I mean, the headlines are just terrible every day. Social media is downright cruel, soaring crime rates, high inflation. And of course, next year, we've got the rematch that no one wants in the presidential election. You know what? Horror makes that all go away for 90 minutes or so. I say long live horror, but you know what? I'm really hoping that someday we won't need it as much as we do right now. Well, that's the show this week. Thank you to Radio America for having me as part of their great podcast lineup. And of course, while I have you listening, please check out HollywoodInToto.com. I update it seven days a week. You've got news, reviews, commentary, all about the crazy world of Hollywood. It is, like this show, the right take on entertainment and woke free since 2014. See you next time.